Thank, thank you very, very much, much and uh, good morning, morning to everybody. everybody. First, First of all, a big thank you to Team IDEC for uh, inviting all, all of us here for this wonderful event and bringing us back, back to the classrooms and, and learning of the classroom. It's, it's really indeed a wonderful, wonderful feeling to be at the back. back. So, uh, Archana has already set the ball rolling and she's made my task much, much, much easier uh, by giving the foundation of what we are doing today. We are going to take you through to a journey of a type 1 diabetic patient from the time the patient is diagnosed to its various stages, from the time the patient, uh, child comes to us in the clinic, what are the important aspects that we need to be uh, caring about, what are we need to be talking about to the patient, especially when it gets diagnosed for the first time, when it comes to the clinic for the first time, what are the points which we need to uh, put emphasis on. And then subsequently, um, uh, Dakshata and Alka are going, you, going to take you through to the journey of the child through different stages right from insulin therapy to adolescence and marriage and other problems that a child may go through. So, <clears throat> so type 1 diabetes is a unique problem or unique burden uh, is what has been quoted. It's an interplay basically of adjusting various complex regimens it could be behavioral, it could be social com modifications, and the, the, there is a need to, of considerable knowledge and skill that a, uh, will help a patient or that will help a child to navigate through the tough journey of hypo and hyperglycemias. Our goal is primarily to make sure that the child reaches or desire the desired goal in the best possible way without uh, basically facing the burden or without uh, having the troubles of hypo and hyperglycemias. So Swati is a happy girl, 12 uh, years of age, uh, living in a semi-urban town, uh, uh, studying in 8th standard. His father is a clerk and mother works in a factory, has two siblings, older brother and a younger sister, no past medical history of anything in the family, gets diagnosed primarily for the first time with uh, type 1 diabetes, comes to us with uh, characteristically high sugars, with ketones, and uh, with classical symptoms that have been there for us some period of time. We all know that what we are looking for, the symptoms primarily in a patient with type 2 1 diabetes normally presents to us sometimes in an acute stage with diabetic ketoacidosis and uh, severe weight loss and dehydration, vomiting, polyuria, polydipsia is there. Sometimes uh, we are nowadays we are seeing a lot of cases, younger and younger people getting detected and maybe coming at a much earlier stage to us also, may not yet go to a stage of diabetic ketoacidosis, but may come much earlier. They may be in a stage of uh, antibodies positive, but still not reach the stage two or stage three of type one diabetes. So we need to be careful about the symptoms that basically are, uh, and we should be talking about especially the symptoms uh, to these uh, families also. We look at certain investigations when a patient comes to us for the first time. Of course, the fasting, postprandial sugars, and HbA1c are the gold standard that we look at. Mainly, GAD antibodies, GAD antibodies, islet antigen 2, and zinc transporter are the three main antibodies that we are looking at, which will give us a confirmation of a patient with type 1 diabetes, especially for an age group where we are seeing more and more younger people with type 2 diabetes also getting diagnosed. It becomes important for us to distinguish very clearly that we, whether the child is a type 1 or a type 2. So uh, GAD, uh, islet antigen 2 and zinc transporter are the three pro, uh, antibodies or the three markers that we are always looking for. C-peptide has its own fallacies. Yes, C-peptide helps us to find out the insulin reserve in a person, but uh, initially when a child gets diagnosed with diabetes or any person with diabetes, the C-peptide levels are usually lower and we don't rely only on that level initially and we need to give some time uh, after ther the therapy being started to see again whether the C-peptide has gone up or no. So if you look at the ADA recommendations uh, for screening particularly, now. Uh, a child get, can get diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, but it is also important, Dr. Prasanna Kumar also mentioned in his talk earlier, that it is important for us to detect these cases also as early as possible. Lot of research is going on, something to prevent type 1 diabetes in the future. And for that, screening an individual for type 1 diabetes becomes important. 
American Diabetes Association recommendations clearly say that a screening for type 1 diabetes risk should have a, a panel or should be tested mainly with insulin autoantibodies is what has been recommended. And persistence of autoantibodies is a risk factor for clinical diabetes and may serve as an indication for intervention in the future trials. There are different stages of type 1 diabetes actually. If you see, there is a stage 0 you can say or the pre-diabetes stage where a a uh, child may have antibodies positive, but is still asymptomatic, may not have the sugars being high, and you may just detect them at a very, very early stage. Stage 1 is a stage where the patient uh, or the child is antibodies positive and then gradually starts developing dysglycemia. Uh, in the next stage, there is an abnormality in the blood glucose level, earlier seen impaired fasting glucose or an IGT is seen in the earlier markers, and or an A1C may be somewhere between 5.8 to 6.4. And then comes the stage three where the patient child becomes asym becomes symptomatic, develops symptoms, the blood sugar is high, even C crosses 6.4, 6.5. So it is important for us to detect a child much earlier before they progress to a stage two and stage three. After somebody is diagnosed with this, it is also important for us to clearly give a diagnosis and at this age where Swati is at 12 or 13 years of age, it could be more or less a type, we have to distinguish it from a type 1 and a young type 2 also. At a slightly elder, uh, older age, there can be monogenic diabetes also which could be presenting uh, younger people and so there are clearly signs which tells us what, what is typically type 1 and what is not type 1. Presence of ketoacidosis, presence of antibodies clearly distinguish these uh, individuals from type 2 and monogenic diabetes mainly. This is what Arjuna also showed in a slide. The center of goal or center of uh, therapy is always education for a family and for a child with type 1 diabetes. When, the, uh, when they are sitting in front, of our, uh, in front of us in our clinic, we need to be talking to them about various aspects in the very first visit. It could be it should start with monitoring, it should start with act exercise, nutrition counseling, emergency care needs to be taught to them well, uh, talking to them about insulin therapy. So the central basis for treating a child with type 1 diabetes is always education. It is not a prescription, it is not something that you write an insulin therapy and just tell the patient to go. That does not work. So it requires a dedicated approach, it requires a team approach, it requires time for a doctor to give to a type 1 patient. A, a busy OPD with 20 patients sitting outside where you want to finish it fast is not the right kind of atmosphere where you'll be treating a child with type 1 diabetes. A team comprising of educators, counselors, leaders, particularly with type 1 diabetes becomes very important. When, when somebody with type 1 diabetes talks to a child with type 1 diabetes, the impact is much, much stronger. A nutritionist and a coach which would guide the entire uh, process. So following diagnosis, the major problem that comes to a child and to a family is again psychological. The major crisis that uh, impacts, the, which immediately affects is the belief, the, the fear of the disease, the shock, the disbelief that is there, denial is there. Many times we see the patients and the relatives telling us that this is just a one-off report. We didn't, I don't think it is true. It could just be because of eating something for a few days that we had festivals or we had marriages, etc. because of which this could be there. These kind of myths, this kind of anxiety is always there and we need to uh, talk it out to the family. We need to talk to the patient and make them understand what the true, uh, the true picture is. A new family is always vulnerable and traumatized. We need to be talking about these various aspects, mainly busting the myths around type 1 diabetes. In today's times, with social media and with so many things being out there, every day some new comment comes and we have to uh, un make them understand what is true and what is not. We need to talk about insulin always, we come, which becomes very, very important. Once a patient, we start on insulin for the first time, they may go into a honeymoon phase after a certain period of time, and that's where the requirement of insulin again comes down. And that is the time when he, many people make this uh, mistake that they stop insulin completely. We need to make, tell them from the very first visit that insulin will be required for the lifetime and insulin will be required on each and every day, irrespective of the dosage or even if the dosage comes down addressing the honeymoon phase, warning against alternate therapy. So many times we see these problems that patients after being stabilized on insulin suddenly are away, from, they do not follow up and they come back in ketoacidosis because somebody has advised them some alternate therapy and they land up in a trouble. 
perfecting insulin and monitoring techniques is important. Learning to manage hypoglycemia is very, very important. Hypoglycemia is a, again a big fear and one episode of hypoglycemia literally shakes the child, literally shakes up the family members also. You look to look for look look for comorbidities which could be there. Sometimes a patient is diagnosed late. Sometimes a comorbidity may already be setting in. So we need to again assess for that. Following diagnosis, the other important aspect is to accept the disease, accept the problem. Many times that is the biggest again burden or hurdle that we have to convince the patient that what is right for this. When my doctor prescribes insulin therapy, the first reaction is always no. Why me? Why should I take insulin? And so on. Patients with type 1 diabetes and their families should be again accustomed or should be ex uh, exposed to various team, as I told you, a psychologist, a nursing staff, social workers, schooling. We need to spe give special advice to the school authorities. We need to give them, uh, we need to adjust the school timings, etc. also for this. So insulin therapy becomes the first thing that we should be talking about when the patient, uh, when they visit us for the first time, remove the cobwebs of insulin from their mind again, talk to them about insulin technique, the right way to do it, because faulty insulin technique is one of the major reason where because of which they don't reach the desired goal and sometimes they'll end up with again lipohypertrophies, lipodystrophies and diabetic ketoacidosis. The site rotation becomes very important again to prevent these things. Storage of insulin, especially in interiors, in smaller towns, sometimes where refrigerators are not there, we need to be guiding them and giving them these advices. Keeping the gap before insulin again is very important. Many type 1 patients are, or most of them are on uh, human insulin still, and they need that 30 minutes of gap between the meals and the insulin, which needs to be emphasized upon. We need to explain them the type and action profile of each insulin because after going out from your clinic, most of the child, most of them will be managing their diabetes, managing their insulin doses on their own. And if they do not know the, what kind of action profiles their insulin is or which, which insulin is working for how many hours, they will not be able to do this adjustment on their own. This is one of the study done by Fitter, which showed that by Fit, which uh, clearly showed the ignorance for patients who were taking insulin with type 1 diabetes, and most of them did not have any idea regarding so many factors like depth of injection, length of the needle, how long to wait, or how to pinch the skin fold, etc. And these are very small, small things which needs to be emphasized upon. Insulin regimens, of course, Alka will be covering, but basically for any type 1 diabetic patient, basal bolus is what is being recommended and what should be emphasized upon. Premix insulin should be discouraged and should be clearly told no, and more, even if for the convenience aspect, and all patients with type 1 diabetes has to, have to be on uh, four doses or basal bolus regimen where we are giving three doses of shorter acting insulin or a, a rapid acting analog, and an NPH, twice a day or an NPH at night or a longer acting analog at night time or bedtime. The next aspect which comes along with insulin therapy is monitoring. Any patient with on insulin therapy has to be told that self-monitoring or SMBG is the, again goes hand in hand with insulin therapy. It is important because primarily it helps us to give us the or achieve the desired glycemic control. It engages, educates, and empowers the patient, thereby reinforcing the behavior of the patient. We need to make them understand that SMBG is going to tell us where they stand. It is just by taking insulin is not the only solution. We need to understand or explain the child in that language that if the child is studying and appearing for an exam, the results is what he's waiting for. Similarly, an SMBG is something which is going to give him the results of his, uh, uh, the exercise that he's doing every day. But tell the patient and the relatives the importance of SMBG. Talk to them about CGM also in today's time because every patient needs to be ignorant or needs to know about uh, CGM also. Uh, try and tell them about various other uh, uh, tests that we, they need to do like HbA1c, urine ketone monitoring, microalbuminuria, and other parameters that need to be evaluated like retinopathy evaluation. 
again smbg requires certain important tips to be told storage of the trips the exact technique of smbg to be done record keeping is important uh, nowadays we have mobiles and datas and everywhere how the smbgs or logbooks can be maintained in today's time and child in fact the younger people or the adolescent are very very tech savvy and they love to do that and they keep doing that on their own also when we are doing looking at that so uh, simple charting of monitoring and logging is what is advisable tell them to which time of the day we need to check the blood sugars uh, mainly seven day profile or seven different times of the day and tell them give them a chart of which uh, and it's easy they, we don't tell them to do the test all seven times in a day of course it's not uh, practical enough but give them an give them an idea that they can do any one or two tests in a day at different different timings and that's how a logbook can be maintained the other important aspect comes again as i told you about cgm it is something which is be gradually becoming cost effective in our country slowly and slowly so any patient who can afford cgm uh, can preferably do that also and it is going to give us a larger picture regarding the glycemic control nutrition is again an important aspect that has to be spoken about for in the first visit and at every visit whenever the patient is coming to us uh, tell remove the myths from their mind regarding nutrition the myths that are surrounding diet carbohydrate counting is the essential therapy or is the essential way to go in a patient with type 1 diabetes talk to them about in between snacks talk to them about bedtime snacks uh, talk to them about certain religious diet especially during fasting etc which they should not be doing or when they, or how they should be eating meal planning becomes important per se and it's important that they adhere to the meal plan and uh, the snack at adequate timing especially coinciding with the insulin physical activity especially in younger and adolescent again those who are exercising those who are doing their uh, routine it becomes important tell them how the blood sugar levels can fluctuate before and after exercise tell teach them about the insulin dosage especially the shorter acting insulin how they can adjust the dose before doing an exercise or after exercise to prevent hypoglycemia and mainly that is what is important again for a patient who is exercising regularly hypoglycemia the symptoms of hypoglycemia needs to be told to them important is to explain them the rule of 15 of when they uh, get an episode of hypoglycemia how to correct them without any help which is there which uh, if uh, help is not achieved immediately they should be uh, they should be ready enough to tackle hypoglycemia at home a sick day regimen is something again which needs to be spoken to them about uh, about what they should be doing and taking adequate fluids checking their urine ketones on that particular day adequate insulin dosage Uh, which needs to be given or an extra amount of insulin which needs to be taken if the sugars are high for more than a certain period of time and to decide when hospitalization is needed is what again is very, becomes very important so education and tool is something which is needs to be told about there are different ways again to talk about we need to assess how receptive the each family is or each person or each child is and then talk to them about different aspects of education like from basic monitoring to cgm to uh, pumps etc which needs to be told in gradual visits every time peer group activity becomes important a child when they realizes that he is not alone or he or she is not alone with this kind of disease overall the social acceptance becomes much better psychological acceptance much be becomes much better talk to them about people who have had this disease and how they have done well in the past explain them or give them examples of leaders give them examples of uh, celebrities who are doing it or who are already with type 1 diabetes and talk to and explain them how they have achieved in their life in spite of having this problem and they, overall it motivates them to do better so <clears throat> way back in 1933 jocelyn had said that true it is a fight but there is a pleasure in the struggle victory comes to the courageous look upon a type 1 diabetic as a charioteer and a chariot uh, as drawn by the three steeds mainly diet exercise and insulin it takes skill to ride one horse intelligence to manage two but a very good teamster who can get all the three together because it was in 1933 i think in today's time we can add two more horses to this it is education and it is monitoring which would overall help a type 1 diabetic to ride the chariot much better thank you